I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is our text. Uh, we're wrapping up our series on uh, Isaiah about hearing the voice of God, and uh, we've been looking at prophecies that uh, have to do with Jesus, and, and uh, this is no different today. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you if you're in the room. Turn to page 729, and you will find Isaiah 53, and you'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if if you are uh, here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one of these with you. It is our gift to you because we know that if you have the Word of God, read the Word of God, apply it to your lives, God will change your life. And, and that's what we're all about is life change in this place. By the way, if you're joining us from home, we're glad to have you as well. And, uh, and if you don't have a Bible and you want one, just message us. We'll be glad to get one to you because, again, we want you to experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus as well. Let me also just remind you, if you're at home and you haven't already done so, uh, go ahead and get your elements ready uh, for communion because uh, at the end of the sermon, we're gonna celebrate together Jesus' death and resurrection. So uh, I got some questions to kind of start this off. So if you're, uh, by the way, if you're, if you're joining us from home again, you gotta play along with this. So if you're in a group of people, you gotta raise your hand, you gotta respond uh, and uh, tell the stories uh, later on and all that kind of stuff as well. So here we go, a little confession time. If you're in the room, I gotta see the hands. How many of you love to play matchmaker? Come on, go ahead and confess. Uh, I see, you know, I think some of you are a little hesitant. I, I could change this. How many of you have ever set one of your friends or family members up then? Oh, a lot more hands go up now, okay. So, as, you know, by definition, that's playing matchmaker, right? All right, so how many of you uh, have a spouse or a parent or a friend who loves to play matchmaker? Oh, you guys aren't gonna tell on them because you live with them. <laughs> Is that how this is gonna be? I see, okay. All right, let's go here. How many of you, uh, how many of you are actually couples that were set up on a blind date? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Got, got some people. We, we see those hands. All right. <laughs> okay, it's interesting is when one of the couple raises their hand and the other one doesn't. <laughs> it wasn't a blind date. I stalked you for a month before I paid someone to set us up. Uh, okay, maybe we get more hands this time. How many of you ever had a bad blind date experience? Hands? Okay, there, that's the one that's the most popular right now. So uh, there we go. Hey, uh, when we play matchmaker... Have you never noticed this? If not you, then, then somebody that you hang around. We often oversell the good characteristics and fail to mention the, uh, shall we say, odd characteristics of that person, right? I mean, you kind of like emphasize the great personality uh, over some of the uh, other things. So uh, what does all that have to do with Isaiah 53? Some of you are going, uh, how, how does this relate? Uh, Isaiah 53 is a prophecy about Jesus, and specifically about what Jesus did on the cross for us. And it tells us some very significant things about Jesus. And since Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, I want you to know some important things about Jesus. I don't want you to miss this, because some of you are thinking about following Jesus, and this message can help you decide. Okay, you've been considering it, you want to know some things, you're checking it out, you're like, what does it mean if I really embrace this and become a follower of Jesus? We want you to understand that. Now, some of you need to know this because you're planning on inviting friends or family to come to church with you. Maybe next week for Easter, and by the way, uh, we've got two Saturday services next week, so take your pick, 3.30 or 5. I know you guys are used to coming at 5, but some of you might want to come a little bit earlier and give some space for those we're begging from Sunday morning to come over here. Uh, but, uh, you know, you're, you're inviting them to come to church so that they can meet Jesus, and, and, and that's sort of like a blind spiritual date, isn't it? I mean, I, it's probably apostasy right there that I just mentioned that and equated Jesus. Uh, to, uh, evangelism was setting your friend up with Jesus, but, um, but we are talking about a life-changing relationship. So, in, in essence, you are. And, and some of you have committed to following Jesus, and... Let's be honest, you need to know him better. You need to understand some things about your Savior, your Lord. So let's talk about Jesus. First thing I want you to know is that Jesus was a nobody who loves nobodies. Jesus was a nobody that loves nobodies. Uh, I, I, 
the passage in Isaiah 53 that I quoted a moment ago, um, start, I started at verse 3. I want you to hear verse 2 and 3. It's talking about Jesus. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. In fact, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Okay, did you catch that? There was nothing about Jesus physically that drew anyone to him. That means he wasn't tall and handsome. That means that that he didn't physically stand out in any way. Uh, Just for the record, he didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. And I know a lot of you grew up, if you went to church, with those pictures of Jesus where a lot of times his hair was really light and, and his eyes were really blue, and that is definitely not the case. I mean, if he'd been blonde hair and blue eyed in first century Palestine, he would have been a freak. Okay, everybody would have known, oh, that's the, that's the albino guy. Yeah, okay. Because everybody was dark and had dark hair. So uh, there was nothing about him physically that stood out. And then he was despised. He was rejected. He, he wasn't esteemed, which means he wasn't important. Now, that's hard for us to really grasp, right? Because we've always known Jesus as a rock star, right? He's the son of God. He's the savior of the world. He drew crowds. He performed miracles. He's coming again to be the king of kings and lord of lords. You know, so we kind of see Jesus and we think rock star, you know, because billions of people worship him. But remember, Jesus was born in obscurity, probably in a cave, And he was born to parents that nobody knew or deemed to be important. And then Jesus was raised in a small, insignificant town called Nazareth. Uh, And he was raised to be a craftsman. He was not studying to be a great theologian, preacher. Uh, He was just going to be another carpenter. And understand that Nazareth, the town he grew up in, was so well respected that one of his future uh, apostles actually said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? Sort of like a lot of us feel about Baus. So, sorry to all the brothers and sisters that live in Baus. But um, anyway, look, nobody paid any attention to Jesus once you're past the Christmas story and the people there wanted to kill him. Okay? Nobody paid any attention to Jesus until he began to preach and perform miracles. So, for 30 years, we're talking about obscurity. 30 years. There was nobody except for his mom, and that's pretty common for everyone's mom to think you're wonderful and special and and everything. But nobody thought that this is going to be the Savior of the world. This is the Messiah. This is that person. He was just a nobody. And Jesus started out as a nobody, and guess what? He loves nobodies. Think about this. He chose unconnected, non-influential men to be his original 12 apostles. Right? I mean, he could have picked anybody, but, you know, these guys were, uh, uh, weren't religiously trained. They weren't educated. They, they weren't wealthy. They weren't politically influential. They were just 12 nobodies. That's what he did. And, and while Jesus did heal a centurion's servant and a, a ruler's daughter, uh, most of his miracles were for people of no influence. Right? He healed lepers. You're not even supposed to touch them. And you guys realize that Jesus could have just spoken the word and they'd been healed, but he, most of the time when he healed lepers, he touched them. He, he you know, blessed widows and madmen and blind beggars that the crowd were trying to tell to be quiet and leave Jesus alone. Jesus hung out with societal outcasts like prostitutes and tax collectors. He was a nobody that loved nobodies. See, the, the truth that Jesus loves the nobodies, the overlooked, the ignored, the outcast, it's, it's a huge part of the good news. That, that's one of the things that makes it so special. You don't have to be born into a certain family. You don't have to have a certain status. In fact, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done or what's been done to you. Jesus loves you. And he relates to you. He gets it. After all, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows. 
He knows what it feels like, and he wants to change your life today. See, that's just good news. I, I, don't, I, I hope that like grabs you right now and just changes your perspective. If not, let me, let me just give you a little bit more visual that might go with that. Uh, a lot of people in this room grew up playing on the playground, right? How many of you grew up playing on the playground? All right. How many of you grew up in the era where, you know, the parents, or the parents, the parents and the adults weren't always hovering right around you, and so you had to pick up, you know, pick your own teams when you were playing sports, okay? All right. A lot of you did. Okay. Picking your own teams is one of the most cruel punishments that exists in the history of the world, right? Because you're on the playground, you're a bunch of guys, you're going to play basketball, and so the two coolest and best athletes are always the captains. Can I just let you know that was never me? Okay, just for the record, never me. And, and so those two, uh, no, it shouldn't have, trust me. <laughs> I earned that, uh, you know, complete invisibility. And so the two cool guys are up there and they start picking. And always they pick their best friends and the other most talented guys first. And, and, and look, here's what's going on in my head. I think it was going on in your head. You're sitting there going, come on, pick me, pick me, pick me. Come on, pick me. Not out loud, because that would be uncool. But you're wanting to be chosen. And you're hoping and praying that they'll choose you instead of getting down to the end where they try to give you to the other team. Uh, we're good. You guys take Garrison. That's okay. We'll play six on four. We're fine with that. You see, you don't want to be in that excluded place, and yet all of us at some point in our lives have been completely and totally ignored, excluded, forgotten, maybe intentionally as an act of cruelty by someone who wanted to just dismiss you, or maybe it was accidental, but we know what it feels like. And I'm here to tell you that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who spoke the world into creation, the, the one who will rule and recreate one day, wants you on his team. He wants you. He came into this world to claim you, to invite you, to pursue you. I, that's good news. And I hope that resonates with you. And, and so that leads us to the next thing about Jesus. Not only was he a, a nobody who loves nobodies, but Jesus died so you can have life. That, that, that's what the heart of this passage is about. Jesus died so you can have life. Now, if you, if you want the fancy theological term for this, it's called substitutionary atonement, okay? If, if you want to impress your friends that are religious-minded, write that down. Substitutionary atonement. It's a lot of letters. Too many for some of you. I get that. So what it means is that Jesus literally took my place and your place on the cross when he died. That Jesus actually physically paid for my sin and your sin on the cross. Okay, that that actually happened in that moment. That's why Isaiah said he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. You see, if you ever really question God's love for you, look at the cross. Look at the cross. No matter how much tragedy you experience, no matter how much pain you go through, no matter how much betrayal, rejection, or sorrow you encounter, the cross reminds us that we are loved by God even when our grief overwhelms us and we can't feel it. It is an emphatic declaration that God loves you. God loves you. The Apostle John said that. 1 John 4, 10, we said, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. The Apostle Paul said it in Romans chapter five when he said, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are sinners, Christ died for us. We weren't, we weren't pursuing him. He was pursuing us. Jesus put it this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. He went on to say later in the Gospel of John, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And then he did it. 
He did it. So have you ever had someone tell you they loved you and then they betrayed you? Let's see the hands. Hey, anyone? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much everyone, okay? If you've lived long enough, it's happened. Right? Somebody has, you know, uh, tossed you under the bus, run over your feelings, run over your emotions, run over your soul, and, and they've turned their back on you. Uh, is that love? <laughs> you guys are, are you not sure? It's like, I don't know, let me think about that. So if they tell you they love you and then they betray you, is that love? No, it's not love. And you know that. It doesn't matter what your words are because it's the actions that communicate that love. Now, on the other hand, have you ever had someone tell you they loved you and then they showed you by their actions? See, that's a great thing, isn't it? I really thought you guys would be a lot more enthusiastic with the yes, because hopefully you're sitting by some people who have done that, but I didn't want to coach you in that moment. It's like, come on, say it, say it. Look, this is what Jesus has done for us. Not only did he declare his love for us, but he demonstrated his love for us. Because Jesus explained God's love, and, and, and then he demonstrated God's love in a tangible, visible, eternity-shattering way. And Jesus did it so that you could live with him forever. He did it so you could become part of his family forever. And, by, and for that to happen, he had to take your punishment, my punishment, on himself. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. It's an amazing exchange. An incredible exchange. An exchange that is the picture of grace. You know, you know why it's a picture of grace? It's because every single one of us deserves hell. Well, not me, Pastor. I'm kind of a good person. I do a lot of good things. No, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The glory of God is heaven. So if you don't get to go to heaven, there's only one other option. It's not a good one. Every one of us deserves hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God. Grace is that gift. It's given to us. It's given for us so that we can live in it, so that we can enjoy it, so that we can celebrate it day in and day out. Why? Because Jesus died for us so that you and I can have life. So that you and I could have life. Abundant life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly so that you can have freedom. Jesus said, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. See, Jesus loves you. And he died for you so that you can have life. He became sin, your sin, my sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's who Jesus is. And then finally, got to tell you, Jesus desires a committed relationship. Committed relationship. By the way, when I say Jesus desires a committed relationship, he desires it with you. With you. Specifically you. Because this passage points to the cross. It points to Jesus' death. And, and Jesus, in talking about that, said, if anyone is going to follow me, they have to deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and come after me. Come follow me. This is the life I'm inviting you to. So let me be really clear. Jesus didn't die for you so he could be your life coach. Okay? Jesus didn't die for you so that he could uh, visit you on weekends and special occasions. Jesus didn't die for you so that y'all can hang out sometimes. See, Jesus died to redeem your life, change your life in every single way. Jesus wants to influence you every moment of every day. Understand the commitment that he desires. And, and, and Jesus wants that committed relationship, not some kind of casual dating thing. You go, isn't that awkward? Well, I already talked about you setting your friends up with Jesus. I, I'm trying to, to put this in biblical language because throughout the Old Testament, there is a, the conversation between God and Israel as a husband and wife. And the church, you're part of the church if you're a follower of Jesus. The church is the bridegroom of Jesus. 
And Jesus desires a committed relationship with us. He wants to move into your life. He wants to be in your business. He wants to weigh in on every decision. He wants to influence your marriage. He wants to influence your parenting. He wants to influence your money. He wants to influence your hobbies. All of it. That's what he wants. Um, and this is our problem. Look, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, who died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, this is the point where we have issues. This is our problem with Jesus. This is why we live spiritually powerless lives, frustrated by failures and captive to our weaknesses. Because we want the love of Jesus without the life of Jesus. Because we want forgiveness from Jesus, but we don't really want to follow Jesus. Because we want Jesus to bless us, but not rebuke us. And it's never going to work. It is never going to work. You're trying to manage this relationship with Jesus and all he wants is surrender. He can't be managed by you and me. He can't be put on hold and ignored and yet we want to sing songs that make us feel good about his blessings for a thousand generations be upon us and that's not going to happen because you sing the songs. It's going to be happen because you commit fully to Jesus. Jesus desires a committed, life-changing relationship, and so many of us just want to be friends with eternal benefits. Jesus says no. Jesus wants all of us, all of me and all of you. He wants us to commit 100% to his way, his truth, his life, his values, his kingdom, and it's kind of a take-it-or-leave-it offer. He's not open to negotiating what commitment looks like. Jesus went all in for you. Jesus took 100% of your sin and my sin to the cross, and he 100% paid for it, which is why we celebrate the goodness of God, which is why we talk about extreme grace, uncomfortable grace, grace that abounds to all of us. He was pierced for your transgressions, yours. He was crushed for your iniquities. The punishment that brought you peace was on Jesus, and by his wounds, you have been healed. So will you commit yourself to Jesus? Now here's what I know. For every follower of Jesus in this room, the Holy Spirit is at work, and, and he's talking to you if you're listening. And he's nudging you and he's calling you to that commitment that I'm talking about. And by the way, if you're here and there is no nudging in your life, you may need to think about entering into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And some of you that have never committed to Jesus, you feel an uncomfortableness right now in your soul, in your spirit, which is the Holy Spirit saying, come on, surrender to me. And so when I say, are you willing to commit to Jesus, it begins with those who haven't saying, yes, I surrender. But it doesn't stop there. There's some of you that have never been baptized. You say you love Jesus, you confess Jesus with your mouth, but you've never confessed publicly in the way that Jesus prescribes. And, and I can't think of a better time to get baptized than next week and, unless you just want to do it after the service. Or tomorrow morning, because we're going to do this again three more times. And there's some of you that, that the Holy Spirit is talking to you right now that need to repent I mean, God's been calling you out on your sin and that you've been practicing, that you've been addicted to, that you've been holding on to, and, and it's just time to say, I give up. I'm not gonna do this anymore. And that may mean, you know, calling the church office Monday and scheduling an appointment with one of the pastors to talk about it or scheduling an appointment for marriage counseling because your marriage is falling apart. And, and by the way, it's not them, it's you. But you both need to work on it. Or maybe it's you just deciding you finally are gonna stop playing the games and show up for Celebrate Recovery on Monday night at 6.30 in this room. See, commitment looks a lot different for every single person, but see, God can talk to every single person right now and he's calling you to 100% commitment. 
So will you commit yourself to Jesus? Because in a couple of moments, we're going to take communion, which is a reminder of the sacrifice of the cross. When Jesus said, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of many. But can I just tell you that taking communion is a commitment? It's a commitment to Jesus' way, Jesus' truth, Jesus' life. And maybe today, this will be the first time you ever make that commitment. Or maybe it will be a recommitment. But it really is something you should only do if you're really making that commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Let's pray. Father, none of us have uh, any hope in this world or beyond it apart from Jesus. And we recognize that. We recognize the greatness of Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross for our sin, to take our place, to take our punishment. God, my prayer is tonight that you'd make that real in the hearts of every person in this room and joining us online. And that we would be drawn to you to confess, to repent, to turn away from our sin, to declare with our mouths in baptism, in communion, publicly our love for you. And God, we want to commit to you we are so tired of playing games. We are so tired of living powerless lives. So right now, we want to give all of ourselves to you. We know that you'll receive us with grace because you are always good. In Jesus' name, amen.